Scott Samuel from Mount Barker in South Australia, where he produced Brussels sprouts. So. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as as I've been mentioned, uh, my name is Scott Samuel, and yes, and I am a Brussels sprout grower, amongst many other things. Uh, and I'm actually a 2011 Nuffield Scholar. Uh, and my topic is looking at fusion farming in brassicas and whether that is a sustainable model for, for the future. I was very, um, I'm very grateful to Horticultural Australia, who through the vegetable R&D um, was able to sponsor me on my trip. And uh, I'm grateful for that and, and also the work that they're doing in the, in the vegetable industry. So, uh, as said, I'm from Mount Barker in South Australia and uh, uh, our business is Samuel and Sons Vegetable Farms. We grow Brussels sprouts, uh, also cabbage for processing, and we also uh, buy in steers and fatten them up on Brussels sprouts and cabbage, <laughs> and also, also uh, hay, and um, we have very healthy uh, healthy uh, cattle. <laughs> um, probably a bit of methane around. But, uh, <laughs> um, and so we do about 1.5 million uh, plants a year. And uh, in this forthcoming year, we're actually increasing that by about 20%. And to give you an idea, roughly, we, we do about 50 tonnes per week of, of sprouts, which look like this. Um, this is for you, David. Uh, I know how excited you get when you see Brussels sprouts. So we do a range of a range of uh, packages from uh, half a ton uh, cardboard boxes, uh, loose down to five kilo and ten kilo ice packs, or carton with plastic liners, or carton without plastic liners, and then we do pre packs which are uh, four hundred grams right up to a kilo. And so really, it, it depends on what the customer wants from us, and we'll try and supply uh, what we can for them. So as I said before, my study topic is looking at fusion farming in brassicas and whether that's a sustainable farming model for the future. So some might say, what is fusion farming? And a man by the name of Graham Sait from Nutitech Solutions in Queensland uh, has coined this phrase, which is taking the many positive at, um, attributes and aspects of different farming philosophies from your conventional uh, models right over to your biodynamic and, and everything in between and bring the positive aspects of that into a more functional uh, hybrid. So a major objective for me was to travel around the globe to see what the major commercial brassica growers were doing and whether they were using other methods than um, compared to myself and if there was anything new and exciting out there. These are the um, countries I visited. So the major growing areas of Brussels sprouts around the globe are in the UK, who produce about 4,000 hectares. Netherlands do about 5,000 hectares. Belgium does about 3,000. Uh, and Germany, uh, they're a bit smaller, they do about, about 500, and California does, does a few thousand. Um, in each of those different uh, countries, the culture sort of influenced, to a certain extent, the way their growing techniques was done. I'll hopefully bring that out for you. One of my key findings was that large commercial Brussels sprout growers weren't doing anything um, different to what we were doing. In fact, they were fairly similar. I was a little bit disappointed in, in, in one respect in the fact that their technical uh, know-how or technical experience with, with their soils in particular was rather limited. For example, they would only be testing soils once every three years. Um, we test soils every year um, prior to a crop and I've, I felt that we were quite intimate with our soil knowing um, NPK, organic carbon, organic matter. Most of the people didn't even know what I was talking about when I was asking that, which was um, a disappointment, which I think is really critical for, it, for sustainability. And there's always this, this issue about um, organic versus um, conventional, which is um, always a very emotive subject. Um, I went to a, a farmer's market in, in Madison, and this is an example of organic sprouts. Um, unfortunately, that there we would not be able to sell at all in Australia. We'll be rejected straight away. Um, because of the nature of Brussels sprouts and the way they grow, how long they're in the ground, um, you have to keep them clean from insect pest and damage and also disease. So it's, it's a great challenge on a large scale. And 
I, I came across a few examples of, of other farmers who were, were trying it at an organic level, but it was only on very small acreage and certainly not commercial. Uh, an outlier of uh, my trip was that new varieties are coming along all the time from the big seed companies like um, Bejo and, and Syngenta and so forth. And so here in the, in the centre of the, of the picture is a ornamental uh, brassica which is used in, in Florence and we, uh, my wife and I saw it in France and in Germany and it's, I think actually it's very attractive and um, <laughs> certainly something that I'm going to be having a look at in the future. On the right hand side is a red sprout and the variety is called Red Darling and uh, I have um, been trying that and um, I'm going commercial with that this year uh, with a major supermarket chain and then on the left hand side is also um, uh, there's a whole range of uh, varieties of green sprouts with names like Gigantus and uh, Cyrus and uh, all sorts of funny names which uh, are quite unique. I grow about 15 to 18 different varieties of Brussels sprouts and I can actually tell the difference between them which is quite, I suppose, makes a bit sad, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> moving right along, um, there's, there's a growing desire from the public to know what is put on their food and how it is grown. I'm sure everyone in this room would, would know that and appreciate that. Farmers, markets and community supported agriculture, the CSA, is, is huge in Europe and certainly huge where there's a high population density. So people are really interested in, in looking uh, and being, having a story and a romance behind where their food's coming from. And this here is an example of a farmer's market in Madison when there was about 300 stalls in the centre of, the, of their country <coughs> city. And that place was just packed and, and humming. And uh, certainly that's one aspect and one way you can, can move your product, but certainly not on the scales that, that a commercial grower needs to be able to do it. These six points here are some other key findings which uh, I think can incorporate into a, a functional hybrid. Most of these things I would say that we have all heard of and seen of, but certainly at an intensive cropping um, level, uh, I think they can add value. So Steve Groff from Cover Crop Solutions in Pennsylvania is standing here amongst a multi-species cover crop. In that, in that cover crop, he's got Sudan grass, sun hemp, pearl millet, red clover, tiller radish, cow pea, sunflowers, and field beans. As a, a vegetable grower, a lot of these things I have heard of, I've never ever seen and don't have a lot of experience with. But certainly it was very exciting to see the, the height of the crop, the biomass in there, and also the, the diversity there, both above the ground and in the soil. Uh, also, here's some more cover crops, and also which are used as green manure crops. So a guy by the name of Gary Zimmer, who is a biological farmer and also presenter and teacher, in Wisconsin, he uses sedan grass and also buckwheat as a green manure crop. And also the red clover there was uh, put in by a Brussels sprout grower in Lincolnshire in the UK and he put that in to get uh, nitrogen levels uh, in his soil so that he could uh, then benefit from that with his forthcoming crop. Flower beds and borders are another probably um, interesting topic and certainly uh, worthwhile pursuing. In Australia, researchers are looking at using flowers to provide a habitat and also a food source for natural, natural predators and beneficial insects so that you can use them in your crop. It's a very hard balance to, when you work with nature, you cannot guarantee the same results every time. I know if I put out calcium nitrate, on, I know what I'm going to be getting. If I put out flowers, I, I may or may not get success. It might seem a bit, a bit um, alternative, but certainly I think for the future sustainability and things like this to promote a natural habitat around your crops uh, is only going to enhance and help your crop protection. Uh, I saw a PhD student in, in uh, Switzerland and she had just finished her PhD on planting flowers, uh, a certain flower type in amongst cabbage at a commercial level and they were getting very good success with that, so much so that they were going to be going commercial with that. So there's certainly an increase in the benefit to have this intercropping, um, as Brian had talked about earlier. Now good old compost is something that I saw a lot of. Everyone seemed to be forever spreading it everywhere I went. Um, and I think that's because there's a lot of 
dairies and a lot of big chicken farms close by and so they were utilising that as a source to build their organic matter and also to help inoculate the soil. There's various forms of making compost and everyone uh, seems to have a different opinion on how to use it and what way it needs, needs to be actually uh, uh, put together. Um, it's something worth, worth considering and probably from my point of view, I would like to see it used more as a soil inoculant rather than a way to build organic matter. I think to build organic matter in your soil, use cover cropping instead. It's a lot, you get a lot more biomass and it's, worth, it, and it's probably cheaper in the, in the long run. Protected copying was another interesting um, aspect and it's probably an example of what happens when you run out of chemicals. Uh, on the left hand side, the fine net covering, uh, which I found in, by, um, in Scotland, and the company using that was Drysdale. They cover 1,200 acres of swede, and they, that's the only way they can protect their crop from the cabbage white fly, because there's, there's nothing else there for them to um, protect it. The chemicals are useless, so if they don't use it, they won't have a crop. And it's because they've got contracts with Tesco's, they need to do everything they can to fulfil those orders. Uh, and in England, they use what's called a um, frost fleece, which they use to get early germination and also uh, early protection for seeds that are emerging, just coming out of coming out of winter. But of course, you know, big, large, large and large um, uh, hectares and use of that, but very expensive as well. With all this talk about uh, sustainability and on people on farm, I'm sure all of you are, are do different things to enhance uh, what you're doing, but how do you get that out to the public so that they can sort of see that what they're not buying, the, the farmer who's growing that is trying to do the right thing and do the best thing they can. <coughs> Drysdale uses a label uh, which they created for themselves, which is lean green thinking. And just an example of what they're doing with that, they're using GPS soil mapping, which I suppose is not um, abnormal because the Broadacre boys have been doing that for quite a few years, but certainly in an intensive uh, environment, that's, that's new for us. Uh, a company in France, Femme de Lamotte, are uh, using this uh, organic label, which they designed up, which in French, uh, in English is for the best and for nature, promoting that, they're trying to do the right thing there. And then Hans Muller, a organic grower in Switzerland, is using the bud, which is their national um, organic label to promote uh, his vegetables. Another aspect which, you know, what we're doing right now is networking and certainly at a global level, uh, it's, it's a real benefit of any travel and scholarship. And this is just a, a small hint of the, the people that I visited and the countries. The two brothers there in, in the Netherlands, I've actually lived with them and worked in, back in 2000 uh, on, their, on their operation and I've since been back multiple times and, and saved them. So it's, it's great to have that network and now I can email them and, and ring them and get advice and so forth from them. So personally the impact of this study trip for me was that it certainly with the Global Focus Program it broadened my understanding of, of global agriculture and it reinforced the need for me for, me for the innovation that is critical. And that picture there is three lads on a three row Brussels sprout harvester. So most of us now is on mechanised. And what they've done now there in the last couple of years is they've got actually an automatic sorter behind where the boys are sitting, which actually sorts the sprouts before they're put into the big four ton bunker behind. So it removes the rubbish through cameras and software so that when the, when the product comes from the field, it's already reasonably clean and you don't have to do much more with it. And with all of this sort of stuff, there are many pathways and many ways to get to the, to the end uh, point on the journey, which is uh, a high density, healthy food for the consumer. And of course, the soil health and fertility is critical for sustainability. So in our business, what we're doing, we're going to investigate flower borders and borders and beds on our farm. We need to work out what species uh, are to be done. On, and there is work done in Australia on that, so I'll, I'll further look into that. I'm using different plant species. I've already tried sedan grass and it failed because we didn't get any rain. Um, I've introduced green manure crops. I'm using fava beans and um, rava vetch in amongst oats. They're all stuff that I've never used before, so I'm certainly learning, learning about that. My rava vetch got completely eaten by slugs and sails, so that didn't work either. <laughs> I'm going to revisit the compost used as a form of a soil inoculant rather than as a, a way of building organic matter. 
And from an industry level, I think that um, we really need to continue looking at soil health. We need to understand what's going on under the ground more so. I think we, in the vegetable industry at least, have got a pretty pretty good understanding of what's going on on top. And certainly with, with HAL and with OzVeg, that's that needs to be done there and is getting done. So research and development and then getting that information out to people so they can actually utilise it. So look, in conclusion, I'd like to thank again Nuffield for the, for the sponsorship and the opportunity and for investing in me and also from Hub and also to my wife who accompanied me as, uh, and all the, all, the, all the stuff that she put up with. Um, and then also to my fellow GFP explorers now, if you notice there, we were told explicitly never to wear black sunglasses in photos, and obviously we didn't listen, and neither did the CEO of <laughs> <laughs> so, But thanks to those guys, it was a great, great chat.